Welcome to this week's edition of Bicycle Touring Talk. I am the one and only George Slackig, and I have a passion for traveling by bicycle. In previous episodes of this series, I told you all about my first tour that had started without a real destination and had brought me through seven U.S. and six Mexican states. The tour changed me profoundly, but in April of 2010, it was over. I was back in Ontario, Canada, living in a tiny cabin by a lake. I was looking forward to finding work around my area and living in that cabin, at least for the summer months. I loved my little place by the lake and was hoping to live the bicycle lifestyle in the simplest possible way. But apparently, it wasn't meant to be that way. Through prior arrangements, I had a one-way ticket to Edmonton, Alberta, where I had a female friend. I had met this lady on a Cuban vacation a year before. I decided to take that flight to visit my friend and toyed with the idea of finding a job in Edmonton. Without any expectations, I had responded to a job posting online and gotten a response in less than half an hour. Was this a sign of things to come? I had sent out numerous applications for summer jobs in Ontario and not gotten a single response. While I had enough money to last me a couple of months, I desperately needed to find a source of income. On May the 5th, I boarded a flight to Edmonton with carry-on luggage only. I had no idea if and how I was going to return to Ontario. I remember that day very clearly. It was a beautiful spring day in southern Ontario, but when I got off that plane in Edmonton, it was a snowy winter day. To me, this was another trip, exciting and probably temporary, quite in line with destinations are fake. A week later, <laughs> I had a job. My friend, I'll call her Helen, had become my girlfriend and we were apartment hunting together. If that seems a little hasty, well, it was. We both needed a place to live as her apartment was a subsidized unit for a limited time. The relationship was turbulent, to put it into one word. It lasted about six months, after which I packed my bags and moved out without telling Helen where I was going. The woman I had had a huge crush on had turned out to be mentally unstable. She was struggling with addictions and it had affected me. After briefly considering a return to Ontario, I rented an apartment on my own for the first time in my life. It was closer to my job with the home medical equipment supplier. This job gave me stability and a much needed income. I had no money to speak of the following winter, but managed to negotiate enough time off from my job, unpaid, to return to Cancun for five weeks, where I volunteered at a hostel in exchange for food and a bed. There was no cycling on that trip, except for a few trips to the beach with a hostel-owned bike that was barely ride-worthy. The owner of the hostel had asked me to do some repairs on his two bikes, but there were no tools, so this didn't get very far. The break from the winter was exactly what I needed. It helped me regain my focus on planning another bike tour. My curiosity was about Central America and eventually further south. After my return to Edmonton, I made a very strict budget for myself in order to save up money toward that tour. The goal was to quit my job and go for three months the following winter. I did very well saving money, even with a limited income, until April of 2011. Tax time. It turned out that my accountant from Ontario had deferred a high sum of income tax to this year, 2011. So suddenly I was in the hole for almost $10,000. It pretty much killed my Central America tour for that year. But 
by November, my debt with Revenue Canada was paid off and I managed to plan a trip to Panama where I would go on a small tour just for a few weeks. Once again, I managed to negotiate a one-month absence with my manager, who was now a lot less lenient about it, but granted it because he didn't want to lose me completely. I had put my job on the line for this, and it had worked this time around. My daughter Jessica and I met up in Panama City. She had two weeks to spend, and I had four. We had made plans to explore parts of Panama by bicycle, but hadn't brought our bicycles. The first few days we spent looking for cheap bicycles. I had brought two racks from Edmonton in my luggage, which consisted of two panniers that contained a lot more stuff than I had actually moved to Edmonton with a year and a half before. How hard could it be to find two decent bicycles in a city of one and a half million? It turned out almost impossible on our budget. After visiting several bike shops, we ended up at department stores looking for anything with two wheels. What we found were contraptions that resembled bikes with parts assembled backwards or not at all bottom brackets thrown together without grease and enough play to make the bearings fall out just by looking at them. We were close to giving up and exploring the country by bus when we came across a sort of bargain store in the market district of the city. They actually had bikes that seemed functional. The sales lady reassured me that Muchacho, the kid who had assembled the bikes, was pretty good at it. When I pointed out a few problems with the brakes and once again a slightly loose bottom bracket, she told me, no problem, come back the next day. We ended up buying two identical bikes except for the color. It took another day to get them ready for the trip, make all the necessary adjustments and install the racks. The following day we finally headed out of the city. Due to unforgiving traffic, this was a bit nerve-wracking, but the road got a lot better once we crossed the Puente de las Americas, a huge bridge over the Panama Canal. We took pictures at the outlook point just after the bridge and celebrated with a snack. We had no idea how far we could get that day, nor where we were going to spend the night. We didn't even have a tent. In hindsight, I'd have to say it was crazy. It wasn't too long after that bridge that my rear tire exploded. There was no cause for it other than a dried out or substandard inner tube. I had a patch kit on me, but the tube was beyond repair. So we ended up pushing the bikes on the shoulder of the Pan American Highway, not sure how far we'd have to go like that. We had to reach a place where we could get help and perhaps lodging. Then something unexpected happened. A pickup truck pulled onto the shoulder just ahead of us. In it were two men, apparently on their way home from work. Did we need help? <laughs> we gladly accepted a ride even, we, even though we had no idea who those guys were and if it was even safe. Julio, the driver, took us to a bike shop after dropping off his co-worker. An inner tube was cheap and I was ready to install it right there in front of that shop. Donde van? Julio asked. I shrugged my shoulders since I really had no idea but told him we'd be looking for a hotel. He shook his head and indicated that there weren't any nearby. To me it meant that I had to hurry up fixing my tire so we could still cover the distance to a nearby town by the name La Chorrera where I had found a hotel online. That's when Julio offered to put us up in a spare bedroom at his house. I could fix the tire once we got there, he said. Once again we hopped into the back seat of his pickup. Julio's house was in a gated community and it was very nice. We got to meet his wife Margarita and his son Marco who was Jessica's age and were invited for supper. Margarita had fixed a fantastic meal. 
I can still taste the fresh tomatoes and the cilantro that were probably all homegrown. Julio told us about the history of the bridge we had crossed earlier in the day and that his dad had taken part in constructing it as a young man back in the early 1960s. We had been worried about becoming an inconvenience for Julio and his family, but they showed genuine interest in us and we exchanged contact information before we left the next morning. As could probably be expected with bikes from a bargain store, we didn't get very far on day two. This time, it was one of my pedals that had become unscrewed and proved impossible to tighten back on. Muchacho, our bike assembler from Panama City, apparently had never heard of the reverse thread on the left side pedal and had thereby managed to strip the threads. Once again, we were picked up by a stranger on the highway, a lady this time around. Marta was an avid cyclist herself who really liked the racks I had put on our bikes and openly admired my sun-worn panniers. But she shook her head when she realized what kind of bikes we were touring on. I just nodded when she told me the name of one of the bike shops we had visited in town. We were clearly on an insufficient budget, but in this case it turned out to be a great thing. For the second day in a row we had met amazing local people and received an invitation. We ended up spending two nights by ourselves in a beachfront condo Marta's family owned and probably hoped to sell before we got invited to the family Christmas party. Marta's parents had a house close to the Pan American Highway near the town of El Espave. They had a spare bedroom where so many cyclists had spent nights before us that they had named it La Habitación de Ciclistas. After careful inspection of my bike, we decided on Christmas Day that we'd be better off continuing our voyage by bus if we wanted to see some of the places we had picked out to spend time at. Jessica had wanted to stop in San Carlos, a surfer's paradise. So that was our next stop. We spent an extra day and Jessica got to take a surfing lesson. In the coming days we visited Santiago for a short overnight and then moved to a hostel by the name Lost and Found in the mountains east of David, not very far from Boquete. We stayed there three nights and spent the time exploring the jungle and enjoying the company of other travelers. The hostel was up on a hill and hiking trails led to lookout points from where we could see the Pacific Ocean on the one clear day. Most of the time, however, the weather was cloudy and very humid. Jessica had to catch her flight home on New Year's Eve. We spent two days riding buses to get back to the city and celebrated our last day together with a trip to the Mia Flores Locks of the Panama Canal. Bye, Dad. I got to spend New Year's Eve with a bunch of other travelers at the Mamayena Hostel in Panama City. The hostel was fully booked and despite having no reservation, they found me a place to sleep. A mattress on a balcony. What was I going to do now? I had exactly two weeks left and no bike. Both Jessica's and my bike were at Marta's family in El Espave. On New Year's Day, I decided to call up Marta to see if I could take a bus there and spend another night in the cyclist's room. I would try to salvage one of the bikes and take another shot at touring across Panama. Marta and her family were most welcoming once again. I managed to make one functional bike out of the two we had bought and a day later I was by myself riding down the highway toward the Azuero Peninsula. The ride was not trouble free. It turned out that the tires on those bicycles were of a very low quality, 
My rear tire was completely bald and needed replacement after only about 200 kilometers. I did not let it spoil my tour and ended up having a great trip off the peninsula with stops in Chitre, Las Tablas and Pedasi where I spent a night partying with locals and ended up sleeping in the hammock on the beach. Other stops were at Playa Venao, Tonosi and Macaracas. It was in Macaracas where I had to start thinking about my return to the city. There wasn't enough time left to do it on this rickety bike. I had bent the big sprocket on the freewheel trying to make it up the mountains between Tonosi and Macaracas, so I couldn't even be sure if this bike would take me all the way back. Amazingly though, I managed to sell it to someone local after telling him about my tour and how I had ridden it here all the way from Panama City. $50 seemed like a good deal and it was more than enough to bring me back to Panama on an express bus and spend another night at a hostel before catching my flight back home. It was a rude awakening to arrive in Edmonton in the middle of January. The temperature was in the minus 25 degree range and snow was blowing around everywhere. It wasn't even late at night when I landed but the daylight had already faded. It took forever to get back to my apartment using public transportation. I was due to show up for work the very next morning at 8 o'clock. It was one of the few times in my life when I still had a sunburn while getting frostbite on my fingers and toes on my bike ride to work. The winter of 2012 seemed long. But it had started a couple of weeks late for me. I had already made a commitment. It was about living on a tight budget for the entire year to finally turn my dream of a Central America tour into reality. A lot of things changed for me again in 2012. I'll tell you all about the obstacles I had to face that year and how my commitment got tested to the max. Ultimately, Anyone can go on a bicycle tour as long as he or she wants it badly enough. In a world full of demands, a commitment can change or be postponed in a heartbeat. I was a single guy in an exciting city full of beautiful women and a lot of them single and lonely. At times it got very difficult to stick to my commitment. But that was only one of the challenges to overcome. Or perhaps not. I hope you'll join me for the next episode and consider becoming part of this channel by subscribing. I have a bunch of great videos already lined up just for you. Check them out and thanks for being here. I'll see you soon. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button.